at this cellar that Johnson went to the night of the Markerson party in Fort Worth. Almost all the members of the Secret Service were there, and they were there. They were given free drinks and, and free access to women till about six o'clock in the morning. So they were not in any condition to protect their president the next day when they should have. Now let's talk about Senator Robert, uh, Senator Attorney General Robert Francis Kennedy was shot at 12.15 p.m. June 5th, 1968 at the, in the pantry of the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles. Bobby had been there to speak at a rally and it, when it was over he was supposed to go to a fundraiser nearby and so the quickest way to get to that fundraiser was go through the kitchen and the pantry and the hotel maitre d Carl Euchre had him by the hand was pulling him through the crowd when they went through the pantry there's about 50 people in the pantry so they had really had, had to weave their way through and as they got to the steam tables uh, Carl Euchre was standing about like this and he felt someone trying to get past him on the right and he thought someone was trying to shake Bobby's hand but all of a sudden here came a pistol. Uh, Sirhan Sirhan had a, an eight shot Ira Johnson 22 caliber revolver and he started firing it. Well Bobby didn't have any bodyguards. He had one paid bodyguard named Kennedy who was not a relation but he was not near Bobby at the time. Bobby at the time but Standing next to Euchre was Roosevelt Greer and Rayford Johnson. Rayford Johnson was a famous uh, Olympic decathlon winner, a uh, black man, and, and Roosevelt Greer was a black uh, tackle on one of the uh, NFL football teams. Both of them really were strong guys. So when Sirhan started firing, Roosevelt grabbed the hand of, of uh, Sirhan started beating it against the steam table, and uh, but Sirhan fired all eight shots. Four of them hit people in the crowd. The rest of the shots went into the woodwork or into the ceiling. None of them hit Bobby Kennedy. When Sirhan started firing, there was a fellow standing behind Bobby Kennedy named Thane Eugene Cesar. He was moonlighting with the Ace Security Service. During the daytime, he worked for an aerospace a company there in Los Angeles. But both Sirhan, Sirhan and Thane Eugene Cesar were under CIA mind control. When Sirhan started firing, uh, Cesar pulled his nine shot 22 caliber revolver and started firing. One bullet went through the shoulder pad on Bobby's right shoulder, the jacket, didn't break the skin. The next shot hit him in the middle of the back. Now the second shot was under his armpit and came out his throat. The third shot was an inch behind his ear and the muzzle of the gun was an inch from his head when it was fired. And all the rest of the shots went into the crowd or into the ceiling or into the woodwork. And I count for all 17 shots in my book that night. All right, now, before Bobby was in the pantry, a number of witnesses saw Sirhan Sirhan standing off the side in the pantry drinking a cup of coffee with a lady in a polka, polka dot dress. The lady in polka dot dress was there to put either scopolamine or rohypnol into Sirhan's coffee. Now those two drugs are amnesia inducing drugs. Now every time you have surgery today you're given, besides the painkiller, you're given a, a drug to, uh, to give you amnesia during the time of the surgery. You still feel the pain, but this drug is to make you forget it. So this girl in the polka dot dress was to put uh, one of these drugs in, in the coffee and also to give Sirhan the trigger word so he immediately would become a Manchurian candidate. Uh, she probably also contacted Thane Eugene Cesar for the same reason. Immediately after Bobby was shot, uh, as I said, Roosevelt Greer had grabbed him, uh, turned him over to the police, they handcuffed him, and the police said, why did you kill Bobby Kennedy? 
he said, uh, I, I guess I did. You say I did. I, I don't remember. Now, Sirhan Brashear Sirhan is still alive in Soledad Prison, and he is ever since has not been able to recall about a 40-minute span of his memory during that time of the killing. He's been under uh, interview under hypnosis a number of times, and he can recreate every second except for that short period of time. <coughs> And they've never allowed him to have a, a second trial. Now, why did they kill Bobby? Uh, Johnson hated both Bobby and Jack. And uh, Bobby was his opponent in the 68 presidential race. And probably a 99% chance that Bobby would have beat him out in that, that election and Johnson still wanted to be president. Uh, Bobby probably knew most of the facts about his brother's death, but he was powerless. Even though he was attorney general, he had no power over the FBI because J. Edgar Hoover was over the FBI. And I told you earlier, he said all evidence was under his control and it, he would have it uh, there'd be no evidence leak out that he didn't want out. Uh, Johnson was the most powerful person in the Senate, uh, and so Bobby had no authority, even though he was Attorney General, so he had to become president in order to get that authority. He really didn't want to be president, but that, that's the reason he ran for office. Uh, now, Bobby was probably going to heavily investigate the CIA and, and both Bobby and Jack were going to scatter the CIA to the winds and, and, and break it up. Now this is sort of a humorous story about Carlos Morcello. Bobby had been trying to put Carlos in prison for a couple of years. Uh, they really ordered it, uh, almost hollered at one another in Senate hearings and so Bobby wasn't able to get anything uh, hard on him. So Carlos uh, was born in Sicily, but his forged papers said that he was a, a citizen of Guatemala. So Bobby just said, well, I'll, I've got him out. They grabbed him, put him on an airplane, deported him to Guatemala. They got off the airplane, they loaded him in a truck, he and his attorney. They drove him about 30 miles off into the jungles made them get out and left them there alone and the truck left them and you can imagine all the way back to civilization that Carlos Marcello didn't have any nice things to say about Bobby Kennedy. He was in his business suit and stomped through the mud and back into the jungles. And Jimmy Hoffa also hated Bobby and uh, Bobby tried to put him in prison and uh, uh, Hoffa had put out a contract on Bobby and it was never executed. But uh, Hoffa said one time, you know, Bobby Kennedy every evening uh, takes a swim in his uh, swimming pool behind his house. And all you got to do is there's a hill up behind that swimming pool. Me with my 270 uh, rifle and a scope, I could pick him off easily because he swims by himself. And he made that statement to some people that passed it on. So a lot of people were didn't like uh, either one of the kiddies, Kennedys. And I told you that Bobby didn't have any security. The Secret Service, even though he was running for office, wouldn't assign a Secret Service person. So uh, he, I think he thought he was invincible, that he didn't really give it second thought that they would try to kill him just like they killed his brother, his brother but, but they did. Now before we get into Martin Luther King, let's talk about J. Edgar Hoover. Uh, he was Johnson's neighbor for a number of years. And uh, again, as I got to wonder why uh, J. Edgar Hoover hated Martin Luther King so bad. And then I received this document through the mail and the title of it was Black Like Me. And this researcher had found out that J. Edgar Hoover's great grandmother was a black lady named Hoover from Tennessee. 
and he resented his black blood and uh, he took it out on the black leaders of that time and uh, so that's the reason that uh, Hoover was after Martin Luther King now there was the Frank Church hearings in 1976 in the Senate revealed all of this all these things that the FBI was doing to try to intimidate uh, King and to brand him a communist. Uh, they, they would uh, hire a good-looking black lady to be hired into King's office hoping he would hit on her. Uh, they put out disinformation on Reverend King. They said that both white women and, and black women stand in line to sleep with Reverend King. And this is all related in the Senate hearings, the minutes of it, uh, they tried to brand him a communist, uh, and and they in this Senate hearing, <clears throat> the FBI admitted to the committee that they were never able to prove one thing that Martin Luther King did wrong. I heard the rumors of uh, of the women sleeping with King, and and I believed it. But they say in these Senate hearings that the FBI was never able to prove that. In fact, they put out the lies to the press about that. And by the way, I sent a copy of this book to uh, Caroline Kennedy and to Bobby Kennedy Jr. and to uh, Dexter King and Coretta Scott King because I wanted them to have closure to find out what really happened to their loved one. I didn't expect to hear anything from Caroline or, or Bobby, uh, and I really didn't expect to hear anything from Coretta, but uh, a couple of weeks ago I got a letter from her assistant, and she ordered a case of these books to give out to her friends. And uh, that made cold chills go all over me, that, that, that I had really satisfied her need. She knew that her husband was a faithful person, and, and I had produced the evidence that proved that and uh, I wrote her a letter and I said I will be glad to come to Atlanta and speak to your you and your staff and your friends on this subject and uh, at no cost and uh, so I'll probably get a call one of these days uh, she did pass word on a uh, I saw an article in a paper uh, that uh, a member of the House of Representatives had canceled her hearing on uh, COINTELPRO and that was a, an operation by the FBI that was designed to uh, uh, blackball and to discredit King and uh, so when I saw that article and her name I immediately sent her a copy of my book and I was speaking to three groups out in California and on the way back uh, this uh, congresswoman called had her assistant call my assistant and want to know where Mr. Ross is and she said well he's in California and and so he said she uh, she's going to California can she meet him there somewhere and she said I'm sorry he's on an airplane coming back coming back to Texas and so he hung up and about 30 minutes later this congresswoman called my assistant personally and said I need to get a hold of Mr. Ross I want to find out more about what's going on and uh, she gave uh, my assistant her private cell phone number and so when I called her she answered the phone an assistant does not answer the phone and uh, there's a good chance I'll be meeting her in Baltimore when I speak there and so I'm gonna after I finish this tour I'll go to Washington to uh, give the same talk to all of her staff and anybody that she can get up a crowd and so uh, and that that's a black lady from Georgia and and I'm so proud of her and, and she's my friend and, and I'm gonna do everything I can to uh, to help her now let's talk about the death of Reverend Martin Luther King jr. he was shot at 601 p.m. April the 4th 1968 uh, he came to Memphis to help out the black garbage workers. Uh, they were trying to get some benefits or wages or something, and he was there to speak out for them. And so uh, his uh, assistants 
uh, said that Reverend King was going to check into the Holiday Inn 